Welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending this uh, webinar um, on empowering trans communities at AIDS 2024. And I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Navon O'Connor, and I am the Director of Communications at GATE, Global Action for Trans Equality. I will be moderating this session today. Um, and before I introduce the two speakers for this session, I just want to go through a few housekeeping. So, um, Everyone who's a, a participant in this webinar, uh, we invite you to submit any questions that you might have. There is a Q&A function, um, which you should be able to see near the bottom of your screen. Um, it's uh, got two little chat symbols and a Q&A. If you click on that, you'll be able to submit your questions. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to have a presentation, um, uh, on, an overview of, of AIDS 2024. And after that, we will launch straight into a QA. and a um, So please, um, you know, if anything comes up during the presentation, just start submitting your questions and uh, we will try to get them to them um, if possible during this webinar. Um, so I'm going to introduce our two speakers. Um, uh, our first speaker is Ariane Brusselman. Uh, she is the director of conferences at the IAS. Um, Ariane, would you like to just introduce yourself a little bit to everybody? Yes, hello everyone. Very nice to meet you all from all over the world, wherever you are. So indeed, I am the Director of Conferences at the International AIDS Society. So I'm leading a wonderful team here of, um, um, of people who are taking care of the logistics of the conference. So we're in full speed on that at the moment. Uh, but also of the program. So I'm also leading uh, the scientific program development and the global village program development at the uh, IES. Fantastic. Thanks, Ariane. It's great to have you with us. Um, so our second speaker is my colleague at GATE, Anwar, and he is the uh, movement building lead at GATE. Uh, Anwar, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining uh, from all around the world. So my name is Anwar. I'm based in Paris, France. I'm indeed the um, Gate move, um, Gates Movement Building Lead. I am a trans-Muslim advocate and I have a few years of grassroots activism and community organizing at regional and, and global level behind me, especially in the trans, queer, uh, feminist and anti-racist movements. Um, thank you for having me today. Great, thanks for joining us, Anwar. So um, I think we'll just kick off with the presentation. So Ariane, if you would like to go ahead and share your screen and uh, I'll hand the floor to you. Yes, here you go. You can see my screen. Yes, okay. I can, please go ahead. Okay. So um, I just wanna give you a bit of an overview of AIDS 2024 and what we aim to achieve. And I think it's important um, to start with, with the team and the objectives of the conference as we, we put uh, quite some thinking in um, 2024, where we stand and what we really want to bring forward. So as you all know, the team of the conference is put people first. So we really want to bring back to call the global HIV response to re-examine itself against a very simple principle, at least it sounds simple, um, putting people first. And is the HIV response putting people first? But what does it really mean? Um, and I want to dig into that a bit with you today. Um, well, at, at IS, we believe that this means that we think about solutions from the point of view of the, the most affected people. So for example, rather than thinking of, um, we always say we're hard to reach populations, um, we should think about hard to reach health services actually. So we should be building the HIV response uh, for the individual and especially for the most vulnerable. Um, why we think it's important uh, at EIS, it's because we really are, I mean, it's the DNA of what, what we believe in, is that we do think that we can only achieve progress if we bring people together from different worlds, from the world of research, from the world of activism, and from the world of policy. Um, and putting people first is a fundamental principle for us, it's actually one of our values. Um, so this is all nice and well, but how can we actually get there? How can we achieve that? What can we put forward as EIS in uh, the conference? Um, well, there is a number of things we can do, but obviously we do need the stakeholders. We do need you also, uh, the trans community, to support us and to help us there. But in terms of, like, for example, health, health services, what we, can we present? What can we promote at the conference? 
it's uh, well health services that are built around people's needs. Um, and there's a number of, of, of projects and activities uh, like differentiated service delivery and person-centered care that we can put forward into the presentations, the symposia that we're building. Um, in terms of research, it's also making sure that we um, address or that we, we put communities part of the research um, and that we empower key populations in the research. So we also uh, try to, to put that forward in, in the way we build the program. Um, and last but not least, the language is also important. We do want uh, to promote language um, that is um, that is not stigmatizing, that doesn't have a harmful impact on people. So we do want to put forward a people first language um, at the conference. And it's not an easy task. As you know, the AIDS conference is, is huge. There's a number of activities, but these are really the principles that we want to we want to have as guide uh, the program development um, at the IES. Then in terms of the objectives of the conference, it's also important to put uh, the context on, on that. Um, so we have we had defined four objectives when we started working on, on the program. Um, obviously, we do want to promote um, evidence-based research, so innovation through scientific discovery um, across all scientific um, across all science um, tracks. So we, we don't want to touch clinical science, basic science, but also epidemiology, um, and also the science and the um, analysis of structural and economic determinants of health. Um, so that's really something that's very important for us. So the other thing is what we want to address implementation science. So how can we advance research um, and, and, and present research that addresses the challenges um, of implementing new prevention and treatment modalities. So that obviously includes long acting technologies, but in different, with different population and in different contexts. Um, thirdly, we also want to address key and vulnerable populations. So what are the gaps, the enduring gaps in the HIV response? So where is there more investment needed um, in terms of, for example, as I said, person-centered services, um, neglected communities, how can we work on stigma, uh, transphobia, homophobia, as well as gender, ethnic, and racial disparities. And then last but not least, as we're in Europe and we're close to um, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, we do want to explore the dynamics of the very rapidly growing HIV epidemic in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, with potentially um, um, an emphasis on structural barriers such as criminalization, human rights, but also the impact of the war in Ukraine in the region. Um, so these are really to give you a context of, of the conference in Munich and why we're coming, um, why we're coming, we're going there. Um, in terms of the program, uh, we will have, um, it's a slide full of colors, as you can see, <laughs> but we will have, um, just to give you, you know, the idea of the, the overall program, we'll have uh, five days of scientific program and also five days of global village. The Global Village this year will start on the Sunday because we really want to have a public day. Um, we really want to attract people from uh, from Munich and from Germany. And we will also have two pre-conference days on Saturday and Sunday. And obviously the scientific program will be a mix of, um, of oral abstract presentations, of high level sessions, plenary sessions, and symposia sessions that we have been building uh, for the past uh, six to yeah, six months actually. A um, couple of numbers for you to um, to understand the magnitude of, of the conference. Uh, we had a total of 6,600 abstract submissions, and out of those, we selected 2,600 um, abstracts. As I said, we will have a mix of oral abstract presentation and a, a huge exhibition, a huge poster exhibition this year. So we're moving back to really bringing the posters back in, in the conference uh, with 2,400 posters that will be presented. And in terms of the global village, we also had a record-breaking um, submission rate. Uh, we had more than 600 submissions, and we have um, now yeah, more, more than 170 activities that have been accepted with a, a floor space, if um, that's any um, visualization for you, but 11,000 square meters, it's really big, much bigger than uh, we had in, in Montréal. 
Um, just a quick breakdown here as well on you know the types of activities. Global Village will be a mix of cultural activities, sessions and workshops, and then exhibition and networking booths as well. I'm just going fast to the slides because it's a lot of numbers and boxes, but just to give you an idea of, uh, of the magnitude of, of um, what we will be having. We also have a number of workshops, um, 10 community workshops this year. So we really put the emphasis on community workshops. Um, yeah, and then leadership and science as well. Um, and in terms of what to expect, uh, the program will actually be revealed in um, in two to three weeks. So early May, we should have the online program ready. Um, but there's already a number of things that I can um, I can I can tell you in terms of uh, for the trans community actually. Um, very happy to say that we will have uh, for the global village opening and probably other activities. Avi Jacobs, who is the Queer Eye Germany star. Um, she will be there and um, and yeah we're very happy to have her and we have also a plenary speakers Kate Nambiar from the Terence Higgins Trust um, and uh, she will be speaking about community organizations um, and we certainly touch upon the trans community um, in terms of symposia, we have one symposia that will be fully focused um, on, on paving the way for enhanced HIV care in trans communities with speakers like Rena from Thailand, I'm not going to pronounce her surname, <laughs> and with Aza Radix uh, from the US, uh, amongst others. And we will have a number of symposia uh, that will also touch upon uh, the, for the trans community uh, with speakers like Andrew Spieldener from Impact, um, Amanita Calderon, Sifuentes as well. I'm looking through my list and Toy Washington Reynolds, just to give you a few names, um, sneak preview because they haven't been communicated yet. Um, and we'll have the Ministry of Health, Alicia Cooper from Brazil as well, who will um, speak about um, yeah, overcoming barriers for trans people. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the global village, there will be also a number of activities. There will be a, a big networking zone, um, the Transcend Together, Unite, Advocate, Drive, the networking hub at eight, um, that we hope will be very vibrant. We will have six field screenings um, that really sound very interesting, actually. We we'll have one about trans sex workers in, in, in China. Um, we'll have one on um, in Pakistan. Um, so transgender people in Pakistan, um, we will have one from India as well, transgender women from India and also uh, trans women in Uganda in the current context. Um, there will be also a couple of uh, global village session and an art exhibit as well on um, health migration through the lens of Nepal's transgender community. So these are a couple of examples of um, of the activities that are planned at the conference. I'm sure there are more, but these are the ones that we kind of handpicked uh, for today. So we're really looking forward. As I mentioned, uh, for us this year, it's really important to yeah put people first. So including obviously the trans community. Um, we will have a, a pre-conference as well leading up to the to the conference. Um, so we're very happy to see. Uh, hopefully a big participation of your community this year to the AIDS conference. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Ayan. Um, let me just switch the view so we can all see each other. Um, okay, great. Well, that, thank you for that really comprehensive overview. And um, it's really exciting to hear how much trans engagement is happening at the conference this year. Um, you know, I was taking some notes as you were you were going through because it's a preview for me too of what's coming, you know, um, and, you know, the symposia and um, obviously the, the networking zone which with Gate is um, going to be facilitating um, for the trans community. Um, and uh, we look forward to getting the full program um, in a few weeks time. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll jump straight into some questions. Um, so just to start with, Ariane, I was wondering if you could talk about the IAS rotational policy for conferences and talk us through a little bit about how Munich was selected um, for the AIDS 2024 conference, please. 
Yes, of course. Um, so we we have been thinking um, last year, we did a, a whole revamp of the way we were um, conducting or actually not conducting, selecting our conferences. Um, and we decided to implement indeed a, a regional rotation policy because what we found is that indeed we had been uh, for several reasons, um, including the pandemics, we, we, we hadn't had a very consistent way of rotating across continents. Um, and we also wanted to intentionally be present in some regions where we haven't been present um, very much in the past years and where maybe the organization of conferences are maybe a, bit, a little bit more, more difficult. Also because um, we wanted to be able to compare destinations um, one against the other. And as you can imagine, it's very hard to compare a destination in Asia and from Africa from Europe. So Munich was actually decided before we implemented this policy. Um, because we also intentionally wanted to go to, to Europe. Um, but just to come back to Munich, uh, we had been uh, looking at different uh, places in, in, in Europe. And Munich, Munich was the one that actually gathered most of our criteria. We have a number of criteria that we use when we select the conferences, including obviously the facilities. Can we host a conference of 15,000 uh, people? accessibility of, of the um, of the country and, and, and the venue and the city. Also, we need to look at the viability, so the financial aspects of, of the conference, because we do expect um, a, a contribution from the host country. Um, and then obviously, we need to make sure that we can safeguard uh, the rights of, um, we look at human rights aspects and um, and also that we, we don't have any pressure from, from the government on our program development. So it's really a mix of a number of things we need to look at. Um, and that's how Munich got selected. And for the future, um, yes, obviously we are going to rotate and we're going to apply those criteria. And again, in certain regions, certain criteria might weigh more than others, as you can imagine. Absolutely. And um, maybe you can't answer this question, but do you know yet where the 2026 conference is going to be held and can you share that with us if you do know <laughs> so i'm going to disappoint you i know the region but i cannot tell you where exactly because we're in the bidding process so we're in the last phase of the bidding process for 26 but it will definitely be in latin america okay thank you i appreciate you sharing us that <laughs> um uh, so yeah, thank you for that information and it's really interesting to understand a little bit about how Munich got selected and the future, you know, rotational policy which, um, you know, uh, GATE is fully in support of, you know, because it, it brings that access to the conference to all the different regions. Um, so we uh, appreciate that. Um, so um, I'm going to move to Anwar now and um, my question for you is why is it important to ensure trans engagement at the AIDS 2024 conference. Thanks for the thanks for the presentation, Ariane, and, and thanks for the question, uh, Nevan. So, to put it very shortly, of course, I mean, my whole job is about this question. I feel so, you know, I could spend quite some time, but to put it like very simply, it's about um, visibility, voice, and empowerment, uh, with the idea that trans um, individuals are significantly more um, or significantly affected by the HIV AIDS and historically our specific health needs in particular um, have been overlooked. So trans communities, this is true for trans communities as a whole, but it is particularly true for certain populations that we, we started to, to mention earlier, trans indigenous people or trans migrants and refugees and trans masculine people to name a few. So, so first by actively participating in a global health and advocacy conference, as important as the AIDS uh, 2024 conference, trans activists can actually advocate for a more trans inclusive research, uh, policy making and funding that will directly address these uh, disparities. And, and when I say participating, I, I really want to emphasize that it can happen at diverse level and it should happen at diverse level. It can be as a regular participant, but it can be, you know, as a contributor to the very very rich and diverse program that you, you've been sharing uh, with us, Ariane. Uh, it can be as a civil society partners and so on and so forth. So the conference, uh, the AIDS 2024 conference is a platform where cases for new policies can be made and where um, funding decision can be influenced. And, and another aspect, and this is something that has been heavily demonstrated by literature and empirical data, um, community-led initiative are the most efficient ways to make sure that no one is left behind. 
So when transactivists are involved, we ensure that interventions designed are appropriate and effective for our community. And it's really the, the basic feminist principle of, of nothing about us without us, hence the importance of trans engagement. So no one is better placed to identify and cater to the needs of the community than the community itself. So that's why we really welcome this year the, the theme of, of the conference. And, and maybe just to end on that, trans engagement, of course, um, it's an opportunity to engage for trans people to engage with global health leaders, but it's really a two-way exchange um, because yes, the AIDS conference offers uh, a big platform for trans activists to learn and grow. As we know, many trans individuals, trans activists face such structural barrier that it limits our exposure to this kind of spaces um, where health policies and research agendas are shaped. However, and I, I think it's so cri critical to emphasize that it is a two-way situation and it is also essential for non-community stakeholders, whether they are researchers or, or health professionals or policy makers to also learn about our needs, our priorities. They also benefit from our direct involvement and it helps them understand the unique challenges that we face as a key population. Uh, so the benefit of trans engagement is not just about trans activist learning from the conference, it's equally about educating and enhancing the capacity of health leaders to better serve our community. Yeah, th thank you, Anwar, for that very comprehensive um, answer. And, uh, you know, and I, I echo your sentiment, you know, uh, the theme of the conference this year is very community focused, putting the community first. And um, it actually leads me quite nicely into the next question which I have for you, Ariane, which is um, around the role of the organizing partners um, in helping to facilitate the AIDS 2024 conference. So could you talk us a little bit more through that role and who, who all the organizing partners are? Uh, obviously, Gaze is one of them. Um, and uh, yeah, just any, any other information you might have on that. Yes, um, I, I'm not going to go too much into the comitology of information, which is not, not very interesting, um, but yet important because it's about governance. Um, and we have obviously international organization, complex governance systems. Um, but the thing that is important for, for us is that we do want to also have a continuity. So we did establish a kind of a permanent conference committee that oversees a bit all you know, the rotation, the the, the different conferences that we organize, whether it's its conference, science conference, or smaller research, research for prevention conference. And we have three community civil society representatives that are permanent on, on that committee with a rotation policy, obviously, it will not be the same. Um, but indeed, um, Erika Castellanos from Gates is, is one of, of those three members. We have uh, Jacqueline Alessi from the Prevention Access Campaign. And we have Glory Alexander from the ASHA Foundation in India. So we try to have a mix of an advocacy organization from uh, networks of people living with HIV and of implementing partners as well um, on this permanent committee. So their role is really to bring community voices. We, we do, you know, they help us develop the program. They help us remind us that we need community voices in um, the in, in the sessions. In um, There's also a number of other like more local organizations that are coming um, in, on the organizing committee of a specific conference, but those three are really the ones looking up after the conference cycles. And they also help us and advise us when we actually, for example, now have a bidding in Latin America, um, they will be helping us on, on like community point of view of where they think we should go, we should be going rather than on, on you know, based on the criteria. Um, they're not making the decision, it's our executive board who makes the decision, but they give a, a voice and an advice. Yeah, thank you for that. And actually just um, kind of jumping off of that, because we have a question in the chat um, from Priyanshu, which says, uh, will it ever be in South Asia, considering it's one of the most severely affected areas by HIV? So would you be able to answer that for me, Ariane? Yes, it will definitely be Asia. So we implemented um, a rotation policy. So um, next year in 2025, the science conference will be in Africa. And watch out the news because it's going to be revealed very soon where we're going to go in 25. Um, 26 Latin America. And beyond that, we are actually moving to um, Asia in, um, in, in 28 for the conference. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for that. Um, 
And yeah, it's great, you know, to, that the IAS is so open to including communities at the organizing level, because um, uh, as, as we have been discussing already, you know, it's so crucial to have community engagement at all levels, um, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, implementing services right up to, you know, making decisions around organizational stuff, whether it's at a conference or whether it's within government, within policies and so on. Um, so thank you for giving us, um, you know, a bit more insight into that. Um, so my next question is for Anwar. Um, and um, I was wondering if you can uh, answer for me, you know, why do you think the Global Village is important for communities? Um, thanks. Um, and I think at some point, Irene, you also like mentioned quickly the Global Village, just for those of you who don't know even what the global village is, it's this kind of parallel, very heavily civil society oriented space that is a bit the cultural heartbeat of the conference, if you ask me. And, and what is um, also great to celebrate is that this year is going to be the 20th anniversary of the global village. So it does mean that it works, right? Um, and it's really this dynamic and accessible forum where people from all around the world can interact with the wider HIV response. Um, and what follows is the most important without needing to uh, register for the conference and pay for the registration fees. And this is particularly important for grassroots activists and community members who uh, most of the time cannot afford the, the, the cost of, of, of conferences. So the, the Global Village is really about uh, fostering exchanges and ideas across diverse groups. Uh, and it really makes it a kind of incubator, incubator for, for grassroots movement and advocacy. Um, it is also a very strategic place to meet other key population networks and further strengthen cross-movement building, and especially during these critical times that we are living where we see the anti-rights movement orchestrating attacks against all our rights. And I'm not just talking about trans and gender diverse identity or LGBTQI people. I'm talking also about sex workers, people who use drugs and so on. So it's really about a space where all those communities oftentimes very much overlapping anyway, can come together and um, open a room for cross-cutting issues. I'm particularly thinking, and you mentioned it at some point, particularly thinking about the trans networking zones but, uh, that we can find there, but I, I can further discuss, uh, talk about that later. And bottom line, I think that Global Village is really this informal atmosphere that also encourages um, more spontaneous and organic um, interactions especially comparing to the main conference that can sometimes feel a bit more overwhelming or a bit more heavy just because of the size of it, first of all. And the, the global village, as much as the main conference can lead to very meaningful collaboration. And, and, and then I will uh, stop on that also, um, because there is such a strong focus on civil society um, in the ACE conference in general and at the global village, um, the power of incubation of the um, for civil society engagement goes actually beyond even the AIDS conference, um, AIDS 2024 conference or the Global Village, because every AIDS conference is an opportunity for global organization to tap into by organizing pre-conferences or side events. And as you mentioned, Ariane, uh, that's exactly what we are doing at GATE. And that's what made us decide to organize prior to the AIDS conference, the Unite Advocate Thrive Global Trans Conference, um, if Nevan, if, if you have time to drop the link in the chat, please feel free to, to share. But, but just briefly put, a week before the 2024 AIDS conference, we are going to be hosting a, a, a unique gathering for up to 200 trans and gender diverse activists and key stakeholders from all around the world. And the aim is really to, the aim is really to address the lack of trans-specific and trans-inclusive um, global strategies, particularly in global HIV response. So whatever is going to happen in this conference, so whatever preliminary findings, outcomes, synergies that we're developing there, we're going to channel that and bring that to the global village to continue the conversation. And that's really what the global village is about, is about kind of continuing nurturing movement building and advocacy conversations. Thank you so much, Anwar. And um, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a uh, it's it's a fantastic opportunity for people to um, engage and and um, meet other people, network. You know, and I wonder, was something that you mentioned, Ariane, which really stuck out to me, which was um, you know that it it it's this opportunity for people, um, 
you know, researchers, community people, um, you know, policy makers, you know, all to get into a room together and discuss, um, uh, you know, the, the, the latest in, in HIV care, you know, centering the communities. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could um, go a little bit more into how, how was the theme decided this year? You know, what, what was the, the process around picking that theme and, and what drove that decision to put communities at the center? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. I think it was a mix of uh, putting people first. I mean, it's, it's one of our, our key values at the IES. Um, so as I mentioned, it's really the bringing, bringing together the different stakeholders. And I think it was also leading from the, yeah, the team um, of the World AIDS Day this year. Um, we, I think that's you know leading up to the 2030 targets. That's where we really need to put in our efforts is to really put um, yeah, or communities first and having having them leading the way. So I think it was quite natural um, for us to, to have that as a team. Um, yeah, I think it was a very, very natural. I mean, everyone agreed basically on, yes, this is it. This is what we need to, uh, to push for. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, and we have another question from Priyansu. Actually, I think it's just a comment. Um, I'm just going to read it out. As someone who works in an LGBT plus uh, community based organization in India, just to add a small point to Anwar's great answer that the Global Village brings together lived experiences of people who are affected most by the virus and the societal stigma surrounding it. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you um, for that contribution. Um, and I think that actually leads us quite nicely into my next question for you, Anwar, which is, um, you know, we've already mentioned that there's going to be a trans networking hub or zone within the global village. Um, so can you speak to a, a little bit about what, what we can expect from that space um, in the global village? Yeah, definitely. And, and I also um, shared also a couple of minutes ago that Gate is actually not the only one organizing a trans uh, a networking zone, sorry. Um, we, for instance, expect our partner NSWP Global Network of sex work project to organize a sex work networking zone. So again, that's what the global village is about. It's about bringing communities together that again overlap often time, often time. So when it comes to the trans networking zone, um, you can really think of it as a trans and gender diverse community space, a kind of go to spot at the conference for what we want to do about it is really for relaxing and taking a break from the main conference that can be overwhelming or, or heavy and catching up with peers and trans community members. So uh, we are really aiming at this relaxed, coming together, connecting, chatting over snacks and good sessions. We're still working on the on the program. Uh, you can for sure ex ex expect snacks, but beyond that, you can expect also a, a, a space open from Monday to Thursday to read really rest and, and, and decompress to um, we will host some few um, trans-specific sessions as well, either jointly with partners to discuss cross-cutting um, or cross-community movement building. We will have uh, morning sessions to go through the program together and strategize around how to engage with the main conference. Um, thanks, Nevan. Apologies from uh, the Trans Networking Zone is going to be from Sunday to uh, Thursday. Um, so there's going to be a photo booth and an exhibit to also show the uh, the beauty of our community, which is often case not shown. Um, and this exhibit and photo booth are going to be completely collaborative. So participants will be encouraged and engaged um, to, to uh, participate in, in the exhibit. And uh, finally, we'll host a closing gala, which is going to be, and yet again, a celebratory moment where to bring together the, the, the community. Um, and maybe one keyword of the trans networking that, that I want to emphasize is networking. And networking in this uh, space is really crucial because it allows attendees, again, attendees that are oftentimes those who are less exposed to you know, high level networking opportunities. So it really allows attendees to build connections that can lead and that have already led in the past to collaboration long after the conference ends. Uh, so typically, the um, global trans pre-conference that we're organizing is somehow directly linked to uh, 2018, um, uh, the 2018 AIDS conference. So just to show that these partnerships get nurtured throughout the years and can lead to, you know, um, a stronger and, 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 and more united movement. 
And for those who cannot join the, the trans networking zone, so don't worry because everything important from the trans networking zone will be documented and shared. Um, this way you can uh, catch up on any research strategies or inspiring stories. And um, it's really, and the reason is because the trans networking zone is only one element among a larger movement building strategy. And it really ensures that the trans networking zone is not just a box to tick or not just a conference feature, but a resource that keep on, on kind of being nurtured and keep on uh, helping to push for changes um, uh, and support with, uh, uh, within the trans community. Yes, thanks for that, Anwar. Um, and I can see we've got some some questions coming in um, through the chat. So, um, I'm uh, you know just just to just to respond first to you know what you were saying, Anwar. Um, absolutely, it's so important that we um, collect what we learn, you know, during the conference um, and share that afterwards. You know, it, I, 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 it's a huge part of the opportunity of being able to attend the, the the conference. You know, is being able to take the what we learn back. To our communities on the ground and, and to share the knowledge as widely as possible um and um and absolutely gate you know we will be doing as much as we can to do that during the conference um i see a question here uh from brent allen i'm just going to go through these um as they have come in so as part of putting people first is there an ias policy position to encourage researchers to recognize the role that people living with HIV play in research, either as subjects and or as leaders in sharing sessions at the conference that reflect our lives? I'll hand that one to you, Ariane. Yes, that's actually a very, very good question. Um, and is there a policy? No, we don't have a policy in place because it's very hard to put in a policy uh, when you have to develop sessions and, and, and um, scientific programs, but it's something that we really look into very carefully, whether it's in designing an organizing committee for um, for a conference that we have uh, people living with HIV, um, also in the program that we have as much as we can, uh, people, people living with HIV, community representatives in the panels. Um, and also this year when we had, um, when we do select the abstract, we have a meeting where we have to look at all the abstract and select the abstract. We also made the call that we really had to, to be mindful of that, to really look at research that involves people living with HIV. So it's, it's a, it's a big, um, it's, it's a big topic. Um, and, and we certainly are not, not doing, um, perfectly in, 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 in that, but we're trying our best to advance like we, we do for the people people first language. There's a number of things that we need to, to address that we need to move forward. And I think it's bit by bit, conference by conference that we're probably getting better at it. Yeah, th thank you for that very open answer, Ariane. Um, and so our, our next question is from Mona Lisa uh, Akintole and uh, her question is, I'm just trying to understand why is there a global village and then sub-conferences within the bigger conference? Um, and the reason I'm asking is how do you make sure that that information from those other conferences also benefits the larger, larger population at the conference? Yeah, perhaps I can I can answer that. Yes. So, um, we always, as you were mentioning on the web, the global village is a quite a vibrant space, a public space. So uh, we have the conference, which is, is restricted to the delegates, so the people who were paying to, to attend, and the Global Village is, is really free. Um, so that's why we kind of have two conferences in one, and it can seem overwhelming. But I think there's a logic to it um, that we really want to have that space. And there's so much to, to say. There's so much to put forward. There's so many communities that we want to address that, yes, the AIDS conferences are huge, are big. Um, as my colleague leading the Global Village, Garouche, would say, the, the, the Global Village is the, the Glastonbury of, um, of the HIV AIDS community. Um, so, and, and the conference is more of a like traditional conference where you have sessions and, and speakers and, and Q&As. Um, so, yeah, it, that's one of the main, main difficulty, I guess, of the AIDS conferences. There are so many, so many things happening at the same time. Um, that it's probably hard to pick and choose. But um, what I wanted to say as well is that we do have now um, 
um, we, we do have a, also a virtual conference in the sense that we, we will stream everything. So if you're not able to see a session, you can still access the, our platform and watch, and watch the session that you haven't been able to see. And we do try as much as possible to uh, bring in also the, uh, the messages from you know, our pre-conferences into the main program. Um, by, by carefully choosing the speakers um, from, for our, our symposia and uh, plenary sessions. So I don't know if that, that answered the question, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's also a very good, but uh, tricky endeavor for us. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I think just, you know, thinking on that, what you were saying about the pre-conferences and, and then the speakers in the conference and then, um, uh, my understanding from previous conferences that actually a lot of the people that host pre-conferences tend to also have a space in the global village, usually where people can then network and, and continue discussions no more than we are doing at gate with our, our trans pre-conference followed by, you know, having some space in a networking zone. So I suppose that's also another opportunity for that, that knowledge sharing. Would that be correct to say? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we try to encourage also our partners um, who are organizing their pre-conferences is to really bring their, their message forward that we can then push into the, the main program or the press program. Sometimes we really have some huge announcements that we, we can put forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there was another comment, which um, I think is an interesting one, again, from Mona Lisa, which was, um, you know, uh, AIDS does not silo um, who it affects, but we continue to silo and gatekeep certain spaces. Of course, this will always be the case. Um, there's always, uh, you know, uh, barriers up for people's access. I was wondering, um, Anwar, if you wanted to maybe, uh, I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on, on, on how we can approach the sort of gatekeeping spaces and the silos that continue to exist um, even within the different key population communities and how can we um, create better opportunities for cross-community collaboration and for, you know, top-down collaboration. Um, yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's always this like major challenge of how do we make sure that those traditionally left behind are not left behind and how do we even start by not leaving people behind where they're not even there to advocate for themselves. So it's a bit of this vicious cycle. And um, one first way of doing is also to reflect on uh, what are the values and belief uh, deep down core to the work that we do. And again, that's why I really welcome the idea of like people uh, putting people first and how does that actually translate in practice. And that's typically what I was sharing earlier with this feminist principle of not being about us without us or, you know, other kind of putting it such as like intersectionality and just making sure that the uh, at the forefront you always find those uh, living at the uh, at the margins and that you always have prioritized the voice of those further marginalized and that's why also as i was answering the questions it was important for me not just to talk about trans people because we are, we're never just trans we are trans with sex workers we are migrants and refugees we are uh, li living with disabilities and so on and so forth so as long as we understand these lived realities in silos we will keep on nurturing um, a global, regional, local HIV advocacy strategy that works in silos. And we will keep on missing our targets because as you uh, right, rightfully said, uh, Mona Lisa, the, the AIDS does not work in silo. Um, so for me, it's really about who do you put at the forefront of uh, your programmatic strategy, of your advocacy strategy, of your health strategy. So it really always goes, goes back to that. And I really welcome, I see that there is, I would say, um, some uh, great improvements. And, and, and I see that even through um, everything you shared around, um, around the uh, programmatic strategic thinking around the AIDS conference. There is an increased appetite to further prioritize those further marginalized voices and, and lived experiences. I just think that, of course, we can always do more, always do better, and always nurture spaces where these cross-cutting uh, movement strategies are further nurtured. I, I hope it somehow answers the question. Um, and feel free, uh, Mona Lisa, to keep on um, asking if, if it did not. Yeah, th thank you for your response, Anwar. And I think it touches quite um, you know, well on, on the, the question that Brent brought up earlier You know, around you know, is there a policy at the IAS around putting people living with HIV at the center? 
um, and and that could apply to you know other key populations as well. So Aliana, I was wondering, do you have anything to add to what Anwar said around the IAS approach to the programming? And you know, and I appreciate as well at the start you said you know person-centered services as opposed to you know hard to reach populations, and it's a nice reframing of how we look at these things rather than the hard to reach population. It's the hard to reach services, you know, and and I, and I quite like that you know, reframing of it. Um, so if you've got anything else you'd like to add there. Yeah, no, I think to say that, um, uh, that it, it's interesting to see like the silo within the HIV AIDS, um, and the question about the silo, because I mean, that's exactly why we have an AIDS conference is actually to break those silos, is bring those people together um, and to have them, yeah, realize that, you know, we're all in there together. <laughs> Um, but it's not just silo in terms of communities, but also researchers, policymakers, and and like how do we how do we all get together? Um, and yes, I mean we're more than happy, as we say, we're really building, you know, building with small blocks, conference by conference, improving how we can give better, more voices to our communities that perhaps we we haven't done before. Um, so it's 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 really something that also we will we will rely on our partners or from from the conference committee but others as well on how we can actually move forward um yeah how we can you know break those silos and we're also in, internally we've been reflecting on how we can better address um our communities and our civil society so there's a number of things that are boiling for us um organizationally yeah absolutely and i appreciate it's uh it's never easy to, to to tick every single box in one go, you know. Um, Anwar, I could see. You, did you raise your hand? Uh, you wanted to add something else? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I did. I did because um, um, you know, thank you so much. Because um, so one way of seeing that is, and I think I was hesitating to share further on that because it goes a bit beyond the AIDS twenty twenty four. But I think it's as you said, Ariane, it's it's really why the AIDS conference even exists. So so let's really dig into that. There is. As I was sharing earlier, there's a question of who is at the table and uh, representation and voices and, and who is at the forefront. And then, of course, there is the huge question of resources and by resources, also money. And um, when we see the kind of opposition that we are facing and when we see how this opposition is strategically is trying to divide us, is strategically trying to put against one another different uh, populations, is how do we, for instance, when we think in terms of key population, how do we keep on tailoring and keep on um, addressing the specific needs of each key population without nurturing uh, an atmosphere that is already very present of competition against another? So I feel like it, it goes back to the resources, whether they are financial or non-financial. So yeah, I just wanted to put that on the table. But again, it goes a bit beyond the AIDS conference. Thank you, Anwar. And I see we have another question in the chat from Alexandra Rodriguez. And she says, talking about the fight against HIV, what are the IAS's goals for 2030 to reduce the number of new cases among, among key populations and to continue U equals U as a commitment at an, an international level? I'll give that one to you, Ariane. Yes. Um, so IAS is not, I mean, we're, we're really an organization. We, we do convene, we do educate, we do advocate. That's what we do. We're not setting ourselves goals for the HIV response, um, but we really bring people together so that they can, yeah, they can discuss how and, and they can bring forward their issues. So um, I don't think that we do have a goal for, for like how to reduce the number of cases um, amongst key populations. It's not our it's not our mandate, it's not our mission, that's what I mean. But in terms of U equals U, obviously we've always been very much in, um, yeah, yeah, we've been behind the U equals U movement since, since many, many years. And, and we actually have a special attention to this movement in this conference as well. We will have a, a number of interventions, a number of speaking roles, uh, symposia um, on the topic as well, absolutely. Fantastic. That's great to hear. Um, I know in the past they've had U equals U pre-conferences with the Prevent and Access campaign. So, um, and they've always been very, very insightful and, and very interesting. So, um, yeah, we look forward to getting that program in a couple of weeks and seeing all what's, what's planned in, in all of these areas. Um, we have another question from Duha. Um, I think uh, I, I, I'm going to leave this open to either of you. I, I was going to address it to Anwar, but perhaps you also have some examples, Ariane. And the question is, can you share examples 
of successful collaborations or partnerships between trans organizations and the HIV AIDS community to, promote, to improve outcomes for trans individuals. I, I can go first if you want, Ariane. Um, that's, a, that's interesting and that, thank you so much for the question. That's even an interesting way to put it because for me, the HIV AIDS community is led by trans people, you know, so it's, so it's interesting because I don't, and, but you're right in practice and that's how we, and again, it goes back to the importance for HIV initiatives or HIV programs to be community led, because as soon as they're not community led, then it creates this like very bizarre and very, very absurd uh, divide between trans people who would be beneficiaries or like users of the health system or whatever, and then the actual professional. And we're really advocating for the idea that the communities are their own experts, just because when you look at historically the HIV movement, it has been, you know, it has been literally lifted by trans people, trans women, trans family people, and, and so on and so forth. So, and, and of course, the first example, I don't know why that's the first that popped, but there are tons. I was just thinking to um, of, um, and, and, um, sorry, a side visit that, Gate staff, uh, we were very privileged to go to see some partners in, in Nepal, an organization called Blue Diamond Society. And um, together with um, also an HIV clinic, they are actually basically, I'm going to put it short, but they are basically running a very trans um, competent HIV clinic. And how? Because trans people are running this place, you know, and, and it's really go back to how do you, uh, what is the difference between a successful um, collaboration and an unsuccessful collaboration is what is the place that you give to um, community and how community is leading or not leading the the, the initiative. Thanks, Anwar. Ayan, do you have anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think your your very own um, Gate and Erika Castellanos, uh, the collaboration uh, we've been having for for a number of years now on the conference is really the one that sticks to my mind. Uh, on um, and that has always been very very constructive, um, where whereby we were really I mean we 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 need feedback from communities where we need to know what we do wrong what we can improve how we can improve it and I think the collaboration has been really tremendous. Um, I'm thinking of of um, yeah of the for example the whole conference rotation how we do it you know what what are the criteria we need to look for that was also really part partly successful because of, of yeah, of, of the gate involvement. And we need to continue to do that because as you said, uh, the trans community is just integral part of the HIV movement. Absolutely. And um, kind of jumping off that question, almost looking at the other side of things, um, I have a question, I think for you, Anwar, which is how are uh, global health forums such as AIDS 2024 important for uh, global trans movement building, um, so sort of sort of flipping the question around, and 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 you know rather than thinking of, of how HIV spaces can you know engage with trans communities and collaborate, how can we use those spaces to build our movement? Uh, yeah, that's that's a, a, an interesting question because I think it's a it's a tricky question, especially. Um, coming from also grassroots or when we look at very locally led initiative, this huge conference in such as the AIDS 2024 can, can seem to be something so remote, so out of touch. What we see, and just through your quick uh, presentation, Arian, um, thanks for that, is that there is so much effort put into making sure that these spaces are indeed relevant and directly tailored to the needs of the community. And what I see in these global health forums, like AIDS 2024, is that these are extremely needed space for the community to come together. And there is, uh, especially since COVID, uh, there, is, there is such an appetite in meeting, in meeting in person. Uh, what we saw with COVID is that the in person, the online meetings cannot replace this like a organic kind of person to person kind of connection. And it is even more true again at times that we're living right now where we are under attack at so many levels. So there is a desperate need to come together and to, um, even if it's just to, to decompress together again as the trans networking zone is, but to kind of create this very organic and very interpersonal connection that then kind of move into partnerships, move into collaboration. It's about um, learning um, about each other's um, 
uh, mistakes and failures and successes and victories. So I'm, I'm really, for me, these spaces, and, and you have this kind of like, you have global and regional agendas of these key um, events, whether they are HIV or, or LGBT, you know, kind of oriented, these key spaces when sometimes it is the only way for certain activists, especially those living in more or less hostile environments or those whose, whose economic uh, situation do not allow to kind of travel overseas, these are the much needed spaces where and uh, where people can meet again and and that's why earlier i was sharing about the trans networking zone that is not just a feature of one conference it's not just about ticking a box it's about kind of creating these regular spaces for people to be able to come and then two months later they're going to be in another space and then two months later and so that the, the kind of strategy and the and the conversation keeps on being nurturing Thanks, Anwar. And Ariane, from the IAS perspective, and, and I think I'll make this our, our last question before I ask you both to give you any closing remarks, because we've got about four minutes left. But um, I know that the IAS also has a scholarship policy. Um, and, and how do, do, you see, do you see this feeding into this ability for, uh, you know, populations uh, living with HIV to come together and build their own movements at the, the, the IAS conferences? Yeah, very good. I haven't touched upon that indeed. Very good question. Uh, we do have um, a large scholarship scheme. So we, as part of our um, accessibility of the conference, we do want to, you know, give the opportunity for people who are not able to travel uh, to be able to travel. Um, so we, we we fund them. It's a, it's a big application, uh, very competitive. Uh, we get, a, as you can imagine, a lot of requests. Um, and this year we have around 900 people that we will fund to attend the conference. Um, yeah, it, it's always tricky to make these decisions, right? Uh, because we have a number of people to address. There, there's some part of the, the, the scholarship fund that we direct towards people who have an activity, an abstract, an abstract presented or a global village activity. Um, but there's also, um, we, we also reserve part of it for, for civil society community members who do, do not necessarily have something to present. Um, and there we also have um, a number of like quotas uh, that we want to provide to our key population, whether it's a trans community, uh, um, we have gender, yeah, gender quotas as well, regional quotas. So it's a very, very complex mix, as you can imagine, um, from for all the key populations so that we can bring those to the conference. Um, I, I was actually thinking when you were speaking about the in-person element um, and how things go so fast at the time when we came out of COVID, when we were preparing for Montreal, we thought that, you know, we had this great idea of doing everything virtual and that it was going to solve all our problems of accessibility. Um, but then, no, we really found out that people actually need to to see each other, to meet, and that's really the value. And I totally agree with you. You know how you know we're really advancing step by step, and we're trying to address certain things, and then we find out that actually we did, you know, we should have done differently. So, um, yeah, this year we really uh, bring, we really try to bring as much as possible people to the conference with the scholarship program. Thanks for that information, Ariane. And um, we have one last question, which is actually around the Global Trans Conference. So, um, Anwar, the, 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 the kind of two questions uh, similar, you know, is the Global Trans Conference available to people who are not in Munich um, and aren't able to attend the IAS in either form? Um, and the other question is, you know, how can I take part? So I think, I, I guess I hate to be the bearer of the bad news is just, as you can imagine, a lot of people want to come in and we do have limited uh, resources, which again speaks to how important it is to push the the, the limits of funding that um, trans organizations are getting. Uh, so right now, as it is, the registration are closed. So we had a, a very open call for uh, registration. We are also providing quite a number of scholarship out of uh, nearly 200 people. We are covering at least 120 people fully. So it is uh, a, a pretty, uh, you know, um, engaged kind of uh, uh, effort from, from Gates' part. And right now we have reached the limit. However, I'm going to um, I'm gonna share in the chat the contact to, um, to ask any question around the conference, which can include, hey, I'm a late registrant and I really, really want to come. How can I do that? And then we can see if we have someone um, who, um, I would say someone who withdrew 
who withdraw their, their, um, their participation, we can maybe squeeze you in. So I'm just going to share the contact and feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, Anwar. Um, so I think that we've reached our time. I just want to um, invite you both. Does either of you have any sort of uh, final words that you want to share um, about the com AIDS conference? Uh, Aliyan, do you want to go first? <laughs> Yes, thank you. It was a pleasure to uh, attend this webinar and we're really excited here. I'm talking about we because I have a whole team behind me here that um, I was very excited to um, to have like the first real back to, to you know, back to the in-person meeting. I know we had Montreal, but you all know the challenges we had there. So we're really looking forward to Munich, um, to a very successful conference and, um, and to have um, um, yeah, perhaps maybe one of the conferences where we'll have the most engaged trans community, maybe ever. <laughs> yeah, very exciting times indeed. Anwar, any final words? Um, yeah, maybe for me, is again, I'm, I'm a bit of a broken record at this stage that for those of you who, want, who are going to come to either the Global Trans Conference or the AIDS Conference, very much looking forward to seeing you there. For those of you who wanted and cannot come or just cannot come, um, please keep in mind that these are only one element among a larger movement building kind of effort that we're all collectively doing. So please do follow us, uh, follow Gate on social media because these kind of opportunities are gonna um, uh, are happening more and more. And I know that we're not necessarily able to bring as many people as we wish. And that's also why we're doing a lot of advocacy effort towards the philanthropic sector, towards the donors, to make sure that we increase financial resources to be able to bring uh, together as many trans um, uh, activists as possible. Thank you so much for, for being with us today. Yeah, and um, thank you both. Uh, I see there's another question in the chat. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get to it today, um, but I do know that there will usually is information on the IAS website around personal safety. So um, I would encourage you to just keep an eye on the AIDS 2024 website and, and that information will uh, become available close to the time, I believe. Is that correct, Darianne? Yes, yeah. yes. Just to go quickly, we have a, a code of conduct and we have a security obviously in place at the conference. Um, we also have a, a positive launch where we encourage people uh, living with HIV from from all communities to um, you know to a safe space where people can relax, recharge, and um, and and simply you know recover from from the from the conference and from all the overwhelming uh, inputs that they're getting. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, yeah, so I just want to thank you both so much for your participation. Thank you everyone for for attending. Um, and for answer, asking all the very interesting questions that we uh, we were asked today. And um, we will be recording, this has been recorded, so we will be putting this onto our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Um, and you can revisit the presentation then. And in the meantime, I just wanna say thank you, Anwar, thank you, Ariane, and um, we look forward to um, seeing everybody at the AIDS conference. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.